for coming. Um, before we begin, I will be ACU's traditional acknowledgement of the country. Is it, is it not coming through? No, no, you just have to. Okay, okay now. In recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's spiritual and cultural connection to the country, and in continuing ACU's commitment to reconciliation, it is customary to acknowledge country as we pass through. Today, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the First Peoples, the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and waterways. We thank them for their continued custodianship. We acknowledge and celebrate the, the continuation of a living culture that has a unique role in this region. We acknowledge elders past and present and thank them for their wisdom and guidance as we walk in their footsteps. It is our great privilege today to uh, continue the second of our series of four lectures uh, with Professor Christoph Mark. She's visiting us from Berlin. Um, he was given a fulsome introduction last night, so I'll not rehearse all of his um, curriculum detail. Uh, suffice to say that he's currently president of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities. Last night, we heard a general introductory lecture laying out a number of theoretical issues. And the next three lectures, we uh, had the privilege of beginning to put some meat on those bones and get down to the nitty gritty of actually um, discussing some specific time periods and figures. So the second lecture today will be the history of Christianity as a theological and or secular discipline in antiquity. But actually, before we turn to that, I think you'd like some questions from yesterday, is that right? Yes. Uh we yesterday thought it would be a nice idea because there was the wonderful good morning first. <laughs> Sorry, that's quite unfriendly not to wish you all a wonderful morning before beginning to speak. And um, that yesterday evening we thought, of course, during the reception, not all uh, had the possibility to ask the questions. So we thought that a quarter of an hour questions to yesterday's lecture, then um, 45 minutes a new lecture, and then the possibility to talk about the new lecture. This will bring in diversity, not only in the uh, lecture this morning. So if you are interested, and also the people at the screen or behind the screen in a certain sense are invited to ask questions, and perhaps Matt Hugo uh, be the chair and uh, short my far too long baroque uh, uh, attempts to translate German sentences without a verb into English sentences. <laughs> <laughs> With a verb. Very, very grateful. So I'll, I'll field questions from the room. Um, I think Jonathan is also letting everyone online know as well that those who are joining us virtually on Zoom are also welcome to raise their hands and ask questions. And we'll try to roughly go in the, in the order um, that, that, we, that we see questions being asked. Um, so who would, who would like to um, begin asking a question about yesterday's lecture? Yes, please. Um, I'm speaking as, as somebody who did history of ideas. Is church history a subset of history of ideas and institutions? Is, is church history yeah. a subset of I, the, uh, the history of ideas and institutions. That's kind of traditionally the way I have. Yes. Um, that's a quite difficult answer. And as I said yesterday, um, th there is definitely a danger that, uh, especially in institutions of uh, theological training, um, history of Christianity slash history of the church, I explained yesterday that the relation is reduced to a very specific way of history of ideas, of history of ideas before the Cambridge uh, new history of ideas, so that you got uh, the, the, the impression it's only a history of the Christian dogma. Yes. But I would think um, as in certain times um, of uh, um, uh, the so-called secular history, history was reduced to a political history, uh, or was reduced uh, in, in Berlin, Prussian history as a history of wars and triumph of Prussia about other territories. These are reductionist approaches 
which from time to time for certain reasons uh, appear. So, um, as I tried to explain um, in, in the first sentence, um, history of Christianity, history of the church is uh, seen from the um, methodology uh, in no way different from the methodology of uh, other historical subdisciplines, or should be. <laughs> That's perhaps uh, better. We'll go on to the next question, which is Michael Champion at the end of the table. Please, Michael. Thank you. So my question is about the categories that you set up. Yeah. Um, and I wondered whether there might be some categories that church historians must take a stand on, but other historians need not yeah. um, Or perhaps a subset of that question might be, um, might some of the oppositions you set up yeah. um, not be taken to be valid by historians of Christianity? That is the stand that a historian of Christianity, church historian takes to those oppositions might be to deny that that's a useful opposition rather than choosing one over the other or integrating them in an interesting way. Um, perhaps the first thing for those who, who uh, weren't able to be present yesterday that we should try to get this slide um, so that they were able to realize what I have said yesterday. Categories. These were the categories, and the first thing I said is these categories in no way I presented to have a full catalog of possible categories. These were only examples which I used because I'm convinced they are able to, um, to, to demonstrate um, how deeply um, the um, telling history, historical narratives, historical analysis are linked to a Christian worldview. Um, that these are these are also in no strict sense oppositions, um, because how, how to explain? It, it's perhaps a kind of scale, and there are certain historians only looking for individuals and certain only looking for societies, but um, most uh, are on such a scale in some way more near to, um, and, or more near to, or they have a quite uh, interesting balance of those. And I don't think that um, the, the, that um, as someone dealing with history of Christianity, church history, um, all dealing with these um, fields have a certain position on, on the scale because that's the ending. When dealing, for example, with the history of the Trinitarian controversy of the fourth century, then individuals like Athanasius, but not only Athanasius, as our forefather thought, have a different influx than in other parts of the history where, where the question of individuals is perhaps of lower interest. So I would think um, it's not only a, quest, a question of the worldview. As I said, like the Chalcedon model, it's the question how I'm um, oriented uh, at the scale between society and individual is depending of uh, my Christian worldview, but also on the uh, historical analysis uh, of the situation of these sources and so far. And uh, indeed, one can add a lot of other uh, of these. But perhaps scale is, is the uh, for for those three uh, above the, the right thing, uh, between action and suffering and uh, life in certain times. Uh, for for uh, people in this country, uh, it's depending on the history and the social stratum, whether one is uh, able to do action or has to suffer from 
other people's action than you have mentioned in the beginning. Is there a question online or did you? There is, yes. Yeah, so we'll try to take a question from Zoom. Well, and, and it, it's been given to me to ask. Oh, perfect. Um, so it comes from uh, Gregory Bloomquist, and he asks, what status does a non-Christian writing history of Christianity or particular aspects of Christianity have? Um, and I think this comes from a lot of what you've been describing as sort of the question of what does, you know, how, do, how does a theologian perhaps approach this? How does someone within, but then the, if you flip it around, does it look different? If there's a non-Christian who's writing the history yeah. of Christianity, yeah, yeah. what might their commitments look like? <laughs> um, that's uh, in so far a difficult question as probably the plurality in a non-Christian writer concerning uh, world views is far more larger than, than in a, a Christian group that might be someone from a Chinese university um, coming up from a certain tradition in China, that might be someone from a very traditional Middle European tradition, but alienated uh, from uh, the, the Christian worldview by a certain experience. Um, so it's, it's quite difficult. My own uh, experience is that uh, all different approaches to a Christian history matters and are of interest. That, that, that's, sorry, a very general, uh, um, but, but uh, my impression is, um, for example, when dealing with history of Christianity and antiquity, we, and looking, um, we had last week a large Congress on origin and philosophy. And um, how Porphyry, as a definitely non-Christian writer of the history of philosophy, looked to origin is of interest because it gives uh, an impression how someone writing the history of philosophy, which is a sub-discipline of writing um, history, looks to a Christian philosophy um, uh, in antiquity. and. Uh, that's also crucial for a, a reconstruction of Christian history done by Christians. It, it would be a pity to ignore. So, uh, by my watch, it's about 20 minutes past the hour, and we're starting late, so um, I think we should probably turn now to today's lecture. If you do have further questions, however, on yesterday's lecture, um, please bear those in mind, and um, we would welcome to ask those uh, in the remaining time at the end of this session. Uh, so, are you happy to return to today's lecture, Christoph? Is that yes? Okay, excellent. So, uh, many thanks for your questions, and uh, we move to the second lecture. As I said, um, the, the intention of the series of lectures is not to give a full overview about the history of um, the uh, history of Christianity um, as a theological or secular discipline. That would be, that be nonsense to try in four lectures to give a full overview. So my impression for today's lecture is I try to deal only with three examples. And uh, 45 minutes for these three examples are far too short. Luke, Eusebius, and Augustine. That's far too much. So um, my interest is not <laughs> to give a full overview about the research of these three, but only to ask the question, is it possible to speak here um, of something like history of Christianity as a discipline, seen not from our viewpoint, but from the viewpoint of antiquity. Would, and now we are by the question of non-Christians, would a pagan reader of, <coughs> a pagan reader of Eusebius and a pagan reader of Augustine take their works as contribution to the discipline of history and antiquity? 
And there was obviously a discipline of history. There were genres related to um, this discipline. And uh, the named Luke, Eusebius, and Augustine tried to write down contributions, as we will see, to the genres related to the discipline. And our question is seen from our yesterday's analysis, uh, how the methodology, the usage of the me methodology of the discipline is related to the usage or po positioning uh, in regard of the categories. So the Christian worldview and the categories uh, uh, and their Chalcedonian relation, uh, the unity in difference um, to the methodology um, in the historical discipline used, and especially the, the, the relation in the all-day work, how the categories and the worldview are influencing usage of methodology and vice versa. That's my question. So it's in the enormous amount of secondary literature to all these three, uh, only a very, um, not simple, but a restricted question to a large field. But um, what I would like to start with um, is a short introduction. And this introduction is related to the question, um, why uh, and in which sense Luke is the first one? Um, because there were a, a lot of uh, different ideas. Who is the first historian seen from the perspective? Um, I had a long discussion with one uh, of my colleagues on the question, is it allowed to use the term scientific or scholarly for history and antiquity? And uh, I think that that's a large debate and we can uh, use, uh, I think, nearly all the time we have to answer the question. Um, I would think uh, according to antique standards, uh, we have a clear-cut methodology bound research, um, a, a discussion and institutions of this scholarly work. So I think uh, one can talk about a scientific approach to history from uh, and, and according to ancient standards. And the question is, who was the first Christ, Christian reaching these standards? And um, the, the interesting question is, was there a longer phase of historical improductivity? And uh, the uh, term of historical improductivity of early Christianity uh, comes, um, th there are probably also English authors using this concept. Um, I apologize for always using German male researchers, um, but um, uh, it was Walter Kühler who coined um, um, and using concepts of Nietzsche's uh, friend Oberbeck. Probably you have heard of all these things. Um, they were convinced, and Köhler um, used these uh, Nietzschean overback concepts uh, and spread them out uh, in dictionaries and classroom books. And the idea was because of the apocalyptic atmosphere and the eschatological expectations of uh, the first generation. There was no interest to tell any um, of, of historical narrative because the expectation was tomorrow the end will come and there was no need. So Christianity at the beginning was closely related to uh, historical unproductivity, no need for history, and um, only the a complete change of this um, apocalyptic expectations and eschatological expectations lead Christianity to uh, the idea of a history, of a salvation history, 
And the other person developing this concept was uh, Hans Freiherr von Kampenhausen, the leading uh, Protestant church historian of the second half of the 20th century in Germany. But the question is, is this model right? I'm, I'm always against these dualistic concepts. These dualistic concepts at the beginning, no interest in history, and then suddenly the um, idea, oh, sorry, Jesus is not coming back. We have to develop a complete new theology, and we have uh, completely to revise our principles, and suddenly history uh, came up. And uh, to uh, challenge this concept, I would like to look to Luke. To Luke, and um, I'm, I'm not quite clear that, that that's a quite familiar term in, in the German um, uh, uh, research literature concerning Luke, the double verb, das Doppelwerk, but it's also uh, an, an English term. And the question is, um, what about Luke? Is Luke a person who stands alone? And is Luke someone without continuation? And is there a kind of pause between Luke and Eusebius? Is Luke a prodromos, a forerunner? And is Luke late or like uh, my academic teacher, Martin Hengel, and especially Adolf van Harnack said, there are unpublished lectures in the uh, Berlin State Library of Harnack concerning the history of church history. And Harnack's first lecture always was Luke. Luke, as uh, there is always the question in these traditional patriarch paternity models, who is the father of church history? Uh, that, that's a little bit uh, said um, as an ironical uh, re remembrance of these uh, traditional terminology. But the interesting question, Luke's concept, um, for example, the title of the Acts of the Apostles is uh, related to a title um, in Hellenistic history, Praxis. This is a title used and a genre used. So the question is, um, is this something which comes late, like the traditional model Thor, or like Martin Hengel always said, that it is surprising that in this early time of um, Christianity, there, there was an interest first to combine the history of the group, the history of salvation of mankind, the history of the um, uh, uh, revelation of God to his people with the secular history. That, that's quite interesting. In the beginning of Luke, the combination of these two and using the method of uh, Hellenistic historiography, telling anecdotes, telling anecdotes which are um, of astonishing, which catch the, the interest of the readers, wonders, uh, interesting things. And so one gets the impression Luke tried to write down something which could, uh, in, in a bookshop, where we have these wonderful informations about Celsus entering a bookshop and asking for a New Testament. So um, someone entering a bookshop in Alexandria and asking the question, any new interesting praxis here? And the uh, owner of the bookshop said, yes, th there is a, a quite uh, a astonishing group uh, somewhere in, in the near Eastern uh, and Eastern border of the Roman Empire. And they have now also a praxis. Would you like to read? And, and so um, here we have in Luke the first combination of using method and genre of Hellenistic history and combining it with a Christian worldview. And the, the interesting question is how the, the relation between these two um, was modeled between the worldview and using the methodology, the style, the genre of Hellenistic history. 
<clears throat> and the the impression is <laughs> what I always said yesterday. There is always a tendency um, to um, establish the Chalcedon model of a unity in division only in the prefaces. Luke has this wonderful preface history and in, in the preface and in the beginning there is a quite interesting attempt to combine the secular history, the Roman emperors and uh, the, the Christian history but then you got the impression he was taking and in, in the preface uh, the work is carefully done then you got the impression um, it's more or less using stories from other gospel traditions. And the idea of being a Hellenistic historian disappeared um, to a certain extent. Um, to, to a certain extent, it's still visible. Uh, but um, so I got uh, the impression, and uh, you hopefully too, in analyzing uh, the first attempt to write a history of the church slash history of Christianity, you got the impression um, that the um, place in those texts were the uh, unity of the worldview, the categories, and the methodology of so-called secular history, so of Hellenistic history, is uh, in the Chalcedonian sense uh, worked out is the preface. It's the beginning of the acts and not uh, the, the whole story and definitely not the surprising end uh, of uh, the, the acts of the apostles. Now I skip a lot of other authors. I should be coarse. Um, th the idea that there is a large break and then suddenly Eusebius came is wrong. What we have to think about Elisippus, we have to think about um, uh, some lost um, uh, attempts to use the style of chronicles to use the analytic uh, model. Um, so uh, if we would have a, a whole term, or this is a, a, a whole book on the history, then would we had to speak about these um, texts. That I will skip and move uh, for reasons of time to Eusebius. And uh, Eusebius is of specific interest for us um, because um, mostly uh, we, are, we would look only to his uh, history um, of the church, his ecclesiastique historia. But um, I would recommend also to look to his chronicle because that's a quite interesting book. Um, and um, for those um, uh, in our group who are not uh, extremely familiar with the work of Eusebius, um, I would uh, contextualize a little bit the production of these two works of the Chronicle and of his church history in a certain institutional framing and in a certain biographical framing. The interesting thing is um, these dates are uh, 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 dates around 264-65 that Eusebius as someone in an older age became bishop and also in an older age uh, begin to write history. That's quite interesting. And um, he was uh, located in a certain uh, institution of higher learning. It's a little bit difficult uh, to be precise uh, in which sense the so-called school in which origin um, uh, in Caesarea thought uh, was still functioning or whether it was a library. We know uh, a lot of the style of uh, higher learning. And what is of interest, Origen's teaching was in no way related to history. 
So the program at the school of Caesarea during the time of origin, we are speaking of the 30s, 40s, and perhaps of the midst um, of the third century was not related to his history, to historical literature. There is in the enormous amount of writings of origin, no um, really historical text that was commenting on biblical texts and a kind of, how to say, de principiis um, uh, uh, early form of uh, systematic theology, which was the, the highest course, as we know from Gregory the Wonder Worker's farewell speech uh, of a deeply um, uh, uh, deeply impressed uh, um, a pupil of origin, um, where he gave an, a short uh, introduction in, in what origin taught and in the schedule of the school. <coughs> what is quite clear, it was uh, linked with a library. Um, perhaps uh, they, uh, there was only one master copy of the Hexapla, and this master copy uh, was stored in the library of Caesarea, and um, uh, Eusebius was in, in a certain way linked to this library and used the library. That's quite clear um, uh, beside all unclarities. And the interesting thing is that uh, his um, history of Christianity um, his um, ecclesiastical history appeared in editions and uh, appeared in editions. And I will not um, go into details and discuss uh, the two uh, ways of, um, of uh, arranging the chronology of this edition. I'm following it for those uh, who are experts uh, in, in the room, the chronology of Timothy Barnes. That's, uh, to, to my uh, impression, the most convincing way of chronology, um, which uh, leads to the consequence that the first um, edition starts 295. So for the large um, political developments uh, which happened in the beginning of the fourth century. But um, I would like uh, first to start not with the ecclesiastical history, but uh, with the uh, chronology, with the chronicle. These were certain uh, slides which remind um, to the uh, city of Caesarea, but it's a pity we have only excavations in the harbor zone, and so no impression of uh, the um, library or the school of origin, which would uh, interest you to shape more precisely uh, the way uh, they were doing things. Um, Eusebius is obviously the first after Julius Africanus but um, the first who is using masterly certain techniques which were developed in ancient historiography to synchronize. He's the master of synchronization. And uh, that makes quite clear that to the um, methodological um, uh, toolbox of ancient history, not only the narrative and chronology um, was um, a part of, but also uh, the synchronization. Um, uh, antiquity offered a, a lot of different chronologies and systems to a uh, fixed time. From the beginning, um, uh, questions of hour, questions of counting of days, questions of counting months, questions of counting years according to the emperors, according to um, the, the question of eras, of cities, and, and uh, there were attempts in the contemporary um, historiography scholarship to uh, establish uh, tables of synchronization. 
And uh, the, the uh, wonderful thing of Eusebius is that Eusebius introduced, and that's the reason why I put these um, uh, uh, copies of manuscripts at the screen, Eusebius developed techniques um, to optimize and to make these um, synchronizations better. And that's quite interesting. What he did is he introduced um, uh, lines, uh, not only in the form of columns, but also, as you can see there at the wall, um, uh, lines in this direction, so that you could easily or better uh, um, orient yourself in such a page. And that's obviously something, um, as you easily can imagine, that's not uh, something <clears throat> uh, which I, by care for um, uh, comparing all forms of synchronization tables, uh, realized um, that's something experts here um, described. Um, the, there were certain lines, but the usage of these lines to um, structure the synchronization tables, that's something Eusebius introduced. Why I'm presenting this um, perhaps surprising detail, because to my impression, Eusebius is the first historian from a Christian background who um, offered contributions to the development of methodology. In regard of the chronicle, he offered a, a certain new form of arrangement of the synchronization tables. And uh, in his um, Ecclesiastica Historia, he also offered a new contribution to methodology. Uh, th there is a long discussion on the question uh, how to describe the um, if, um, Ecclesiastica Historia of Eusebius, a heavy debate. And I would propose that I first um, will present certain citations from the province. Then we would, um, uh, for a short time, discuss certain possibilities to describe what is um, happening here. And uh, at the end, I will explain my thesis that comparable to the chronic, uh, chronicle, Eusebius also in his Ecclesiastica Historia developed a, a new contribution to methodology. It's, it's not a groundbreaking thing, quite clear. It, because of that, I labeled it contribution. So also it is uh, someone with a strong Christian worldview, uh, with a, a strong um, the influence of the Christian worldview in the uh, in those uh, works, because uh, the uh, chronicle is arranged according to a Christian system of chronologization. Uh, also, uh, the, the influx of the uh, theologian Eusebius is strong. There are also contributions to the development of methodology which are independent of the Christian worldview. To introduce in a synchronization table a line is in a certain sense related to the interest uh, to bring a Christian chronology in the table more visible. But it's not um, something which is, um, how to say, an expression only of the Christian worldview. You can use a line and arrange the table in a completely different sense. Um, so um, to the, um, <clears throat> to the um, uh, beginning um, of um, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the preface, Eusebius said, I want 
to report about the number of transactions recorded in the history of the church, the number of those who were distinguished in her government and in leadership in the provinces of greatest fame, the names, the number, and the age of those who, driven by desire of innovation to an extremity of error, about at the fame which was beset the whole nation of the Jews from the moment I uh, interrupt, um, I'm uh, ending here my quotation. You got from the preface uh, the, the impression that uh, the church history of Eusebius is not in the same sense a history narration like the other history, contemporary history narrations. It's like Helmut, uh, Helmut uh, like Eduard Schwarz, the, the editor and the Greek uh, Christian writer said, a collection of materials, a collection of lists. It's a collection of lists of bishops. The lists of bishops seen from a theological perspective as the via doctri, as the line of the authoritative line of bishops is one of the um, uh, lines of arrangement. But <clears throat> the collection of something, the, the history of Eusebius is a collection of something, is a collection of sources, is a source book, that there are so often citations, is a collection of names, is a collection of lists, and as it is uh, announced in the preface, a collection of certain things and collecting things, so not establishing a narrative. And that's surprising. And there were in the secondary literature, um, especially since Eduard Schwartz debates, is this um, something which uh, reveals us something about the abilities of the writer of Eusebius. And I think that's completely the wrong approach. The question whether Eusebius was able to write down a fascinating narrative of Christian history that he did obviously not. Um, the um, historian, um, uh, ancient historian of the Hebrew University, Doron Mendels, published a wonderful book, which is called The Media Revolution of Early Christianity. And he said the Eusebius history um, of, uh, of the church is a media revolution. Um, yes, in a certain sense, yes, using this paradigm of media revolutions. Um, seen from my research interest, it's a contribution to the methodology of uh, publications of uh, historical research. The, the, the wonderful um, uh, first uh, Herodotus, uh, what is his, uh, Historia? Historia is publication of research. It's publication of research. So Eusebius introduced a new form of publication of research that one can label as media revolution because it is quite successful. Um, looking into a bookshop, there are lots of these source books with introductions, collections, um, material collections, appendices. Um, the, the narrative is not the, the only possibility. So Eusebius introduced a form of writing history which is different, which not only survived in um, Christian histories of Christianity slash church histories, but was used since then in completely different attempts to write history. And in so far that Adorn Mendel's media revolution is quite correct. So um, looking, um, because time is running so uh, 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 rapidly, um, I will conclude. Um, Eusebius um, 
is a quite interesting example for the relation of theological categories or categories uh, revealing a Christian worldview and historical method. They are inventions in the historical <coughs> method or in the form of publication of historical method. And these inventions are used um, to express certain, uh, certain theological ideas, the idea that we can arrange the synchronicity not according to the era of Gaza or the era of Veritas or the emperors or whatever, but to a Christian worldview, or to be a little bit more precise to a Jewish Christian worldview. And um, uh, that we can use um, the um, if publishing of documents and lists and source texts um, for a certain authorization of a certain um, approach of church um, or a certain approach of a group, uh, of a certain group, which we label majority church. Um, to uh, Christianity, to the, the idea of Christendom. Um, so th there is a relation between the methodological inventions and the Christian worldview, but they are independent of and are today and since then used completely independently. So um, now uh, it would be of great interest to ask the question, what happened um, in the uh, church historian's work after his imprisonment? That is also something which I had to, to skip. The, the, the interesting question, um, in which way they continued and they uh, completely revised the, the Eusebian concept. And the, the interesting observation is that Eusebius was the a uh, far more revolutionary uh, person than his successors, which often happens. But that the people in continuation um, haven't really realized um, the idea um, and tried to um, bring back uh, this form of history to a more a classical narrative in the sense of uh, um, Hellenistic traditions of writing history. Now, the interesting question um, of Augustine in, in the last minutes. Uh, I'm only interested <coughs> in, in the question of Augustine uh, to, to ask the question, um, is Augustine responsible for a certain, how to say, um, change in the um, relation of historical method and uh, theological um, interpretation of the categories um, in Christian history. It's, it's more a question concerning medieval history. Is the shadow of Augustine overshadowing uh, those um, interesting contributions to the history of um, to the methodology of history, which Eusebius gave. So shadowed Augustine, uh, the media revolution of Eusebius. That's my question. So, so it's only a very restricted question in the, how to say, in, in, in the large sea of uh, Augustinian mm -hmm. texts and in the large, in, in the shall I label it nightmare of secondary literature, which I completely uh, ignore at the moment, and only asking a question um, concerning uh, the shadow of Augustine in medieval texts, Otto von Freising and all these authors. And uh, uh, because I have only five minutes, um, I present only the, the answer to the question. It's quite clear that, that Augustine is far more well informed than we normally think. The, the, the way we are looking to Augustine is that we think that, 
there is a strong thesis about the um, development of history, especially in the city of God. That we think that's an, uh, a certain anti eusebian concept of the, the Roman Empire, and that we think it, it's a predominance of the categories and the Christian worldview in the categories about historical methodology. What in the last decades, um, the, the impression was is that we, um, for, for certain reasons, level down the historical knowledge of Augustine and the pagan predecessors of this worldview. So that um, uh, chronicles he used um, historical. So um, we have to distinguish our question. We, we had in mind um, during the second lecture was a little bit too broad because certain types of uh, historians we haven't distinguished. There are the epitomizer when looking to the uh, books of the Maccabeans, there is a wonderful preface where it said there are two types of historians, such one who are producing the um, historical analysis and setting up narratives and others doing an epitome. And uh, Augustine is an epitomist um, of certain impressions uh, on history done by historians. And so when asking the question, how the relation between historiographic methodology and categories uh, coined by a Christian worldview are in a certain author developed, we have to ask the question, is he an epitomist and using only historical works, work of others, or a producer of uh, research and scholarship. And so the, the idea that Augustinian theology overshadowed and a certain um, form of Christian worldview dominated it is correct, definitely. Um, but uh, I think it's uh, imprecise. Um, because um, the, the, um, it's an epitomizer, someone using um, research um, for his own um, uh, worldview. And uh, it's perhaps how to say, because he was so dominant in medieval times, um, not the productive revolutionary ideas of Eusebius, um, but an epitomist's um, idea was present, and that shaped Christian historiography of medieval times. So I promised to end after 45 minutes so that we have more time for discussion. And many thanks. Uh, this was, um, as you could easily realize, a very abridged, more thesis oriented style of lecturing, but perhaps um, more entertaining than uh, reading the manuscript in front of me. And I hope I could enlighten something. Thank you. So I'm just giving as much food for thought so we do have half an hour for uh, discussion. If you are online, um, if you just want to use the raise your hand uh, feature, uh, if you'd like to ask your own question, or you can put a question in the chat and Jonathan would be glad to read it out as we did earlier. Um, and for those in the room, I'll just keep a running queue of the questions that I see and then we'll just go in order. So Don, I saw you first and I see Mark Bessie on the screen. Is there a glass of <laughs> uh, sorry for no, otherwise. Aesthetical. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. There's obviously a lot to talk about. And I think what's very interesting is by choosing three moments, I'm, what I want to focus on is um, how telling the story that way makes Eusebius 
are revolutionary, as you said, and unique. And that's what that's really my question is how unique was Eusebius? In particular, I you mentioned Julius Africanus a couple of times. And so I would like to hear a little bit more about how you view kind of universal chronology, you know, already that integration throughout, not just in a preface, but sort of like throughout a work. Um, and then you say he has successors. So he has predecessors and he has successors. So you also want to say he's sort of unique and different. And then in addition to that, so in, in relationship to that, I'm wondering about history in the school of Caesarea. I think that's a really interesting point and a really interesting question. And I'm curious in what forms history can present itself. So I was thinking again about a text you mentioned, Gregory of Thaumaturgus's Propempticon when he left. That includes a history within it, local autobiographical history granted, but it's still, so I'm wondering in what other genres might you find history that's not historiography, but it's still history. And of course, we're used to this when we think about biography or things like that. Um, and then also, how does history of uh, martyrs of Palestine fit into your non-narrative argument about Eusebius? So sorry, that's a bit of a cluster of questions, but just a greater contextualization of the uniqueness of Eusebius, I guess. Um, I should start with, with a question, question school of origin. Um, I realize um, uh, uh, following your question that I was a little bit imprecise. My impression is that to be um, a, a little bit more precise that in the um, that also origin is um, uh, uh, nearly the whole day explaining biblical texts and so texts of um, historical narration. He is always interested and not to, he is interested to reconstruct history, obviously, because often in his commentaries he is asking the question, it's not mentioned uh, what happened here, but how we can explain, could it be that perhaps, so th there is a lot of historical speculation in the commentaries, but that's not his real interest, that, that's his interest to, to, how to say, to explain a story presented there, his uh, real interest is to make the um, story um, uh, transparent for his uh, readers and hearers. And so the, the interest in history is only in uh, increase the transparency of the story. There is no original interest in history. It, it's only, how to say, um, he uses uh, the, the method of historical speculation. I don't know, is there an English term of if history? What would happen if Herod would have uh, done this or that? Yes. Yeah. If history is perhaps a nice term. <laughs> 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 the, the, the if history. Um, if history and the question, um, can we speculate what is behind the story of the uh, Bethlehem uh, 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 massacre um, of, of, of Herod? Uh, so, so an interest, um, but it's not uh, the interest of an historian to understand history. It's to understand a story and to make the story transparent. And there, Eusebius is definitely completely, um, how to say, completely different. And he's also an exegete, and he is an exegete of the, um, in, in, in a lot of things, quite near to, to origin, but definitely not um, in, in, in the way he, he is interested in history as history. Uh, the, the next question, revolutionary. Um, I have to confess um, that I use the um, term revolution metaphoric. That, that's quite clear. No, no, no blot. In no, no violent changing of, and, and so th that's quite clear. And um, not only uh, metaphorically, that, that's trivial, um, and you know, um, to uh, 
uh, designate quite small changes, introducing a line in a synchronization table is, how to say, it is, is, is a very little changing of such a table, or, or to, to be honest, using lines for specific purposes. Um, but often, um, revel as a, a, a paradigm changings um, in, in um, the history of, of science scholarship are prepared by such small revolutions. And I think um, my impression of Julius Africanus is that he is what we label in, in, in Germany with a nice expression, Wundschriftstellerei, miscellaneous uh, uh, writership. Um, th th there are these wonderful texts where, where he is collecting information about how the um, smell of snakes in a basket could help uh, to, to overcome uh, the, the enemy's army. Or, or, or the, the, and and when, when reading his text, so, so you got the, the impression um, uh, his historiographical work is um, one part of his miscellaneous interest. He, he's collecting lots of things. And um, so I think um, the, the he is, uh, I labeled him a prodromos. And, and to, to my impression, um, there, there was in antiquity the, the wonderful question of the author Serenus how many trees we would label forest. And uh, that's uh, the um, observation that at a certain moment that there is a jump and you got the impression something new happened. And my impression is in Eusebius, there is a jump. It also but, survives, which yeah, helps, so you can even yeah. read it. <laughs> yeah, yes, but, 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 but I have a certain impression of the style of Julius Africanus, also probably a lot of things never ever survived. And also he was involved in uh, library um, of, uh, organization in Rome and other things. There is a nearness to Eusebius, um, geographical, um, uh, in the professions, in the style, in, in doing things, but um, there is a, a certain um, jump which makes Eusebius to a forest um, and uh, him to a collection of trees. And, and uh, this often uh, happens by one single tree. That, that all people are convinced, oh, it's a forest and not a group of trees. Serenus, uh, I don't know the, the English term, the German term is Häufenschluss. How many stones make uh, a hill and how many trees make a forest? We have two questions for you. Yeah, well, I think we should probably go into the next question. I should have said as well, um, if you are asking a question either in the room or online, could you please just state your name and what institution you're at, if, if any? So um, Don is here with us in the Institute for Religion and Cultural Inquiry in the Biblical and Early Christian Studies program. I think uh, we'll go to Mark Vesey next, and, and we should we should say thanks to Mark, especially and Mark I know was, was with us last night, uh, which was well, the middle of the night for him, and is now with us again today. So thanks, Mark, and I'm pleased to uh, go ahead and ask your question. Thanks for your kind welcome. Yes, I'm very comfortable right now. Um, Mark Vesey, University of British Columbia, uh, where I do not have a chair of history. And I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. But what I first wanted just to suggest is, I mean, if Eusebius as a chronicler become, becomes a forest, that is very largely, surely, because of the take up of Eusebius's chronicle by Jerome. H had Jerome not taken up Eusebius's chronicle, the impact of that Eusebian innovation might really have been quite negligible. But the, for the forest is of manuscripts of Jerome's chronicle, one of, one of which we had on screen, um, and it's Jerome's chronicle that really sets the template for Western uh, Christian thinking about history, including 
uh, to a large degree, Augustine's City of God, uh, book 18 of which uh, is entirely dependent or very heavily dependent um, on, on the Chronicle. That, that's just, just an observation. I don't mean it to be controversial. Um, yours was a, a selective account and uh, I, I see more clearly now what's at stake in, in Jerome's use of Eusebius. I don't have a chair of history. Um, there are other people in the room who don't have chairs of history either. Um, we, 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 we have no objection to chairs of history. I'm, I'm just wondering though, whether we're not being slightly distracted by the idea of history as a discipline with a capital H institutionalized with academic chairs. Um, and when we see the likes of Adolf von Harnack and uh, Hans von Kampenhausen on the screen, it just sort of reinforces that impression. Uh, whereas of course, in the period of antiquity we're talking about, in fact, for the whole of an antiquity of the Greek or Roman and uh, Western Byzantine kind, there was nothing really remotely like a chair of history to be found or occupied anywhere. Our sense of history as a discipline is, um, please correct, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, my assumption has always been, and I think most other people's too, that it's very much a 19th century German invention with probably something ultimately to do with the University of Berlin. Um, there is no discipline. <laughs> there is no discipline of history in the ancient Greek or Roman world. There are disciplines, and, and Varro helpfully even wrote a, a Liber Disciplinarum, or was it Libri Disciplinarum? Uh, history is not among them. There were schools of grammar, schools of rhetoric, and you know, at least in the Greek speaking world, schools of philosophy. And we can argue about what kind of exegetical schools there might have been in Caesarea and places like that. But we know for sure there were no schools of history. History is not, in the sort of literal obvious sense, a discipline in that world. It is, well, what is it? It's, it's one, one of many possible forms of public discourse used by individuals who have been trained in the disciplines of grammar, rhetoric, and maybe in a very few cases, philosophy. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a form of public discourse among many others used to manage and manipulate worldviews. Uh, there's a whole cluster of possible genres and formats available if you want to do history in that way. None of them very constraining as it turns out. Plenty of room for improvisation and ideological customization, which is why you can get the extraordinary array that you do um, in the late fourth and early fifth century of experimental Christian histories, um, just to stick to the West. I mean, apart from Jerome's um, adaptation of Eusebius, um, Rufinus's translation and extension uh, of Eusebius, you've got the histories by Sulpicius Severus and Erosius, which are completely different kinds of creatures. And then Augustine in the City of God does something completely bizarre. Um, so, I mean, the, the wonderful thing about history, it seems to me in this period, from our point of view, is that there are so many ways of doing historiography, um, not in obedience to any discipline of history with a capital H, which makes me wonder a bit, just to be provocative and respond to your provocation, which has been um, uh, extraordinary already, thank you, uh, whether discipline is really the right category or concept to be coming uh, to these texts with at all before the 19th century? Um, thank you, a, a wonderful question, uh, but, but I think your question can be asked nearly for every form of dealing um, with antiquity uh, for, for certain interests. When writing, for example, a history of ancient literature and using the genre um, uh, term, then the question is, um, is it possible to use um, our idea of genre and our clear-cut classification of genres and you got always uh, um, how to say, to a certain um, extent, imprecise mixture uh, of genres. Uh, I tr I'm at the moment for the handbook um, uh, of um, ancient studies, Handbuch der Altertumswissenschaft, doing a history of ancient Greek pre Nicene uh, literature according to genres. 
And I'm trying to, to bring in a, an, architect, an ancient architecture of genres. Uh, and uh, those ancient architectures always start with hymns. So not with the gospels, the uh, uh, apologetic literature, the, the commentaries, uh, our traditional approach, but with, with hymns. Hymns uh, in, in the Gospel of John, uh, hymns uh, um, in, in, in liturgy, and, and so far. But, but it's impossible. And um, using the, the term chair, the, the, there were no, only a very small number of uh, uh, imperial finance chairs in, in antiquity, a ridiculous less number. So, so the question is um, are we allowed to? collect together certain literary genres and label them um, historiographical work. And are we allowed to look for certain methodological standards uh, which are common to certain of these genres and label them discipline um, in a certain sense anachronistically? Um, and um, I think your, your uh, impression that um, uh, history is cre uh, a discipline created at the University of Berlin is, is quite nice and provocative. Uh, um, I think that they are uh, already in the 18th century. Um, uh, uh, attempts to create a discipline and some other universities, not only German universities, sh should be mentioned. But uh, the, the problem is that uh, a large amount of the taxonomy we are using to describe antiquity is from the 18th and following centuries. And I uh, suppose it's impossible to write ancient history only with ancient categories. And, and so you, you get in, in most things, but um, to, to, to end in, in a little bit more, um, how to say, um, um, in, in, in a little bit more irritated by your question way, I will think about uh, the term discipline. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to, to confess, it came in uh, because of the, the English um, uh, translation uh, of my German manuscript. That, that there is not uh, something like uh, discipline, and uh, that there is not uh, written something like Geschichtswissenschaft uh, or something. Um, so it, it's perhaps easy to avoid discipline or bring in these nice signs which mark uh, the difference. So, so um, I would think what here happened is um, to a certain extent unavoidable, a, a mixture of ancient terminology and ancient content, uh, concepts and our uh, post 18th century uh, modern concepts uh, or uh, discourse of uh, 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 our 20th century uh, concepts. Excellent. So we have a queue forming of people who have questions in the room as well. No, that's all right. There's questions in the room as well as to be short. Oh, oh, yes. you're, you're doing fine. Yeah. So since we have a queue online and in the room, we may just alternate back and forth for a few minutes. Um, so Jonathan, do you want to uh, give us the next question? Oh, sorry, no, sorry. We, we now are going in the room. So David, uh, you were uh, you were the next question here, and then we'll go to the, the next online question. Thanks very much. Um, this is very fascinating. I, uh, I found your, um, oh, sorry, I'm David Abbott here at ACU uh, in, in the Institute. Uh, on the question of Eusebian methodology, that's really, really fascinating. And I wonder if we, I can expand it a little bit to talk more about the nuts and bolts of his methodology. Do you see, for instance, we talked about the Chronicle, but do you see him as he's writing the ecclesiastical history? Do you see him essentially taking the Chronicle, taking all those lists and then fleshing it out in the ecclesiastical history so that, for instance, when he's, uh, you know, he has many of these bishop lists, do you see him as when he's trying to talk about the history of the Jerusalem church 
for the church at Rome, do you see him expanding those lists and then not being able to expand them when, for instance, he comes to Alexandria, where there's so uh, little information? And is that, if so, is that expansion of lists also part of uh, a new methodology in history? Um, the, the first observation is that there is a kind of tendency in Caesarea to collect lists uh, or, or to establish such a form of um, uh, science and scholarly work. There is a wonderful passage when Origen is commenting uh, the Our Father. He is discussing the uh, Greek term epiousios, our daily bread. And there happens the nice thing that he is um, dictating from a stoic lexicon um, meanings of usia. But it's missing the interesting question uh, how epiousios is related to these meanings. So the, the list is senseless. Obviously, he has forgotten to use or something which is in, in, in uh, oral style, um, the German problem to identify a verb at the end of the sentence. <laughs> um, so um, that's the first observation. The, the second observation is um, that there are different forms of lists that in um, tables were um, lists are synchronized. Um, uh, the, the list is um, presented in the shortest form. A name and certain years of the emperor Titus or, or whatever. And uh, in, in, in the Ecclesiastes, um, in the history of the church, um, you have also those lists in a very simple form, um, but um, it's more um, the Caesarean style of uh, collecting um, items. That's the list as a for form of collecting items. And that, that's obviously a, um, a, a style which coined um, this of Caesarea in the third and fourth century, that, that people were proud to be able to collect. Eusebius is proud to have had identified sources and is able to present them. And, um, and, and that's part of a, a larger combination of methodology and um, an interest of um, establishing certain um, certain lines of uh, a Christian worldview in uh, his historical narrative to avoid uh, the word history with a large capitalized. Excellent. I think we'll go to an online question next, Jonathan. Okay. Uh, this comes from Chris Hawker. Uh, Chris Hawker is, is actually Chris is on the screen. You can see yes. Well. Hello. That, that's quite wonderful. <laughs> yes. Great pleasure. Um, and he, this is, I'm going to try and say it in the, in the right tone. Augustine and Epin, very intriguing. <laughs> Could you say more? The Kibitate Day, what a very long collection of epitomies. <laughs> so I think further comment on, on the sense in which Augustine is an epitomizer, yes. given how Utterly that is. Um, perhaps Mark could give the answer <laughs> because he had given um, that um, Augustine is used. Um, epitome is, is uh, I used the term epitome from uh, the meaning um, in, in, in the Maccabeans. In, in, in the prologue, where, where it said, um, some people are doing serious groundbreaking research, others are bringing these things together for other purposes. Um, and in, 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 in 
the, the Maccabees is meant for the purpose of entertainment and entertainment. And, and in this sense, uh, not in, in the sense an epitome should be shorter than they, they epitomize. That's not, I used uh, the, the term epitome that um, research um, in the past can be used for other purposes and that this is uh, in antiquity labeled uh, as epitomizing by certain authors. Um, so uh, that, uh, but, but uh, thank you for the question. That's necessary to clarify. It's not the, the um, other sense of epitome, um, the uh, 10 books of history are epitomized for a classroom book. So you can get uh, it also in a Harnack's history of the Christian dogma is epitomized in one small volume, which was reprinted and is obviously designed for classroom use. And just on that point, and as a way of bringing back onto David's question earlier, in uh, early in the one, the ecclesiastical history, Eusebius refers to the Chronicle as an epitome, an epitome of what he's now doing. So there is some kind of relationship there between those two words, but maybe that's a difference into the epitome. The third, third sense of epitome. So I think the uh, next question in the room was um, just back here. So please go ahead. Well, uh, Dan Madigan uh, from Newman College. Uh, I was interested when, when, you, when you read out uh, Eusebius' introductions. Uh, there seems to be a perhaps a presumption lying behind it, but it, he talks about uh, innovation that was uh, describing heresy and so on. Is there is there a, a tension here? We usually think of history as a as the story of development, whereas he is identifying newness as somehow problematic. Is, is there a fundamental sense that uh, we've almost reached the end of history, we've reached the end of development? Uh, perhaps it's uh, the orthodox lists of bishops that, uh, that uh, give us that, that sense of stasis. Uh, and anything else which is, which is innovative, which most most people in the discipline of history would be looking for development and newness. Uh, that's somehow a problem for, for Eusebius as an historian. I'm a little bit hesitating to, to ask the, the, the question concerning um, the, the introduction of the idea of progress, uh, the, the uh, question of newness in, in, in history. Um, I think. Um, when looking to Christian narrations of um, the past, then from the beginning on, that there were uh, certain options to um, set up this story. One option is um, um, Cyprianus, um, Cyprian, um, talking about the um, things are near to the end, that there are more robbers at the streets. Um, uh, we have problems um, in, 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 in the, the um, um, earth uh, gives um, less of fruit than uh, in the years before. That's one possibility. The, the other possibility is Eusebius history when um, the, which is interesting that um, the, the, for what he is often um, presented as the, the um, as uh, um, Overbeck especially labeled him um, the, the uh, beard cutter uh, of the emperor and these things. Um, this is not in the ecclesiastical history, but the idea that the, the Council of Nicaea is uh, a certain realization uh, of uh, 
the heavenly banquet when, when the emperor was sitting together with the bishops. And this is the, the other way around to, to tell the story. And uh, um, th that all Christian uh, narratives of history in antiquity to a certain extent are related to the question when history will end. And uh, certain models of the ending are part. Um, uh, that's also quite clear. Uh, and uh, to, to my impression, it's more like um, a, a, a toolbox. You can use certain models uh, to deal with the end and to have a story of progress or a story of decline. Um, and uh, it's difficult to, to establish, how to say, a chronology. At the beginning, uh, the decline model, then the progress model. These are parts of the toolbox of a Christian writing history in, in antiquity, or doing historical writing uh, to, to uh, uh, integrate uh, Mark's uh, remarks. We are a couple of minutes past um, our planned end time, but we could start a few minutes late. Um, so um, if you, uh, why don't we take one more question from the room? And I think Michael Champion, I saw your, your hand a bit ago. Do you, if you still have a question. Uh, yeah, I mean, some of them have been asked already, but maybe I can ask my first question today again, um, <laughs> just in a, in a slightly different way. <laughs> so, um, uh, you talked about the introduction of the, the concept of salvation history um, and putting that up against secular history. And that seems to me to be a, a really strong methodological and theoretical shift in what history looks like. Um, and a commitment that a, so, so, and a commitment that only a Christian historian ought to have, perhaps. So here might be a, an example of a category that a Christian historian has that someone who isn't doing Christian history shouldn't have, but which would give a framework for history that, that is quite different. It's, it's a, works as a theory of history that chooses what sources you go to, what events are meaningful in your narrative, um, how you think about the end of history, um, what sort of commitment you have to institutions within history. Um, so that, that's to say, here, here seems to be perhaps a category introduced early in this thing that isn't a discipline, um, but which might shape a way of doing history that would be quite different from some non-Christian ways of doing history of Christianity. That I would doubt. Um, and um, the, the, what, what you presented, I think, is the, the classical um, understanding of salvation history. But, but asking the question how Augustus um, was proclaimed um, as the renewer of the empire, and as, a, in, in a certain sense, the end of history, the wonderful calendar inscription of Um How, um, I'm not mentioning um, of, uh, uh, certain uh, ways of doing uh, history as Marxist historian, because there one could present this as secularization of Jewish Christian ideas. But um, to, to my impression, um, especially um, certain Roman empires um, and uh, probably also certain ways of uh, presenting Hellenistic um, uh, emperors, um, the, the, um, what we label um, ideology of these monarchies um, is quite near to salvation history. So, so, so my impression is um, it's, it's extremely difficult um, to, to identify um, the Christian or a specific Christian um, um, 
but how to say um, way of doing history. There I hesitate. <laughs> And uh, salvation history is a, th th there are these wonderful. Um, if we would have longer time, um, uh, Marcus in his works uh, on, on uh, Augustine polemics against German ideas of salvation history, and the question is this form of salvation history really identifiable, and should one take together uh, Luke and Augustine in one basket, they wrote salvation history, and these questions. So, so uh, despite all problems with the concept of salvation history, um, uh, the ideology of the um, uh, emperorship of Augustus is, I think, a wonderful form of salvation history, pagan salvation history, expressed in, in different parts of the, em of the empire in different ways, in, in, in Rome and in, in Priena and wherever, in, in literature. I think that's an excellent point to um, end our meeting today. It remains for us to say, once again, thank you to Professor Marchies for sharing so generously with us. <laughs> lecture will be uh, Thursday at 11 a.m. Melbourne time. That will again also be broadcast over Zoom uh, and we'll be looking at the 19th and 20th centuries next. I believe that that's correct. Yeah. And many thanks for your wonderful stimulating questions. They will change uh, what I thought before. Thank you. <laughs>